the Lord just quickly put the word in my mouth. He told me exactly what to preach. I didn't have to go hide away and pray for a month and do any of that. Because he just dropped the word in my heart just that fast. And that's one of the things I like about God. If we seek him daily, he'll automatically do that. And so I'm excited about that. And for those who don't know me, and mostly everybody, the only person who knows me in this room besides Liz is my cousin Carol who came to hear me speak. And um, so I'm excited to be, first of all, in Detroit. I am new to Detroit. I'm actually originally from Seattle, Washington. So my husband and I just moved to Troy, Michigan four months ago. And this is my second time over in this area, but my lineage and my inheritance through my mother is from Detroit. My mother was raised in Detroit, so I am so honored and privileged to be in a place that I never thought I would be and representing just not myself, but the legacy from my mother and my family. And so I'm excited about that. And I'll tell you, God is an awesome God. But you know what? When I look here, you guys look so far away. Can you guys not come up a little bit closer? Are we scaring each other in the body of Christ? Or what's up? Just come up a little bit closer. That way I don't strain myself, my eyes. But like I said, I'm excited to be here. I thank the Lord. I thank God for Pastor Bill and and Liz, and we did get to have his company in Florida recently. We saw you didn't make it, and he was doing well. Uh, the conference was awesome. Yeah, I don't know how many of you guys really know about the Free Methodist Conference, but the Free Methodist Conference is now, besides Liz and a few of people before that, we are now, well, Pastor Bill, really, we are now really becoming a place where we are seeing more and more diversity. We, this past year, this year, we celebrated in Florida while we go together, we come together as African Heritage Network. We celebrated our first co-African American superintendents. We have two new superintendents that's over in Texas, all the way through to Spokane, Washington area. We are excited about that. This is the first time ever. We also celebrated another superintendent, Charles Latchett who is in California, Southern California. So we are making headway. There's not a lot of women, but we are still making headway. Back home where I'm from, well, it used to be my home, in Seattle, I was the first African-American woman to become an elder in the Free Methodist okay. in Pacific Northwest. And I currently think I'm still the only one. But God is doing something. And so that's why I'm here today to deliver what God has given me to deliver to you. But before I do, I just want to pray, and I want to pray over this church. Don't get caught up about the size of the church. Don't get caught up about who's here and who's not. I want us to be able to hear the word of the Lord today, but know that God knew you was going to be here. The word is not necessary for that person down the street who didn't come. Let's grab the word for ourselves today. And Father, we just thank you for the word of the Lord. We thank you for you, Lord God, for you are the God who gives life. And you are the God who gives life more abundantly. And Father, we lift up the shepherd of this house, Bill, Lord God. Father, we thank you for your divine healing upon his body. Yes, Father, we thank you for the word of the Lord that's in his mouth. Yes. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for the team to be with him and Liz as they are standing in the gap here in Detroit, Lord God. And as they continue, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, to celebrate you in the midst of what all that's been going on for the last few years, Father, we ask that you would continue to keep them, that you would continue to bless them, and Father, that you would continue to encourage their hearts. And Father, we thank you for those in the house of the Lord that have been, Lord God, steadfast working with them, Lord God. We ask that you would bless them and that you would keep them. And Father, that you would let them know that their labor is not in vain. And Father, we thank you for the day. Father, I ask that you would hide me behind the cross. Father, I ask, oh God, the people will not be caught up on me, the speaker, but upon you. And Father, I pray that the word will go out. And Father, I pray that the word will not be turned back void. Father, I pray, Lord God, that your word would bring life. And Father, we thank you for your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And amen. Chosen by God. Did you not know this morning when you woke up that you were chosen by God? 
God chose you. He chose you before the foundation of the earth. God knew that one day that you would be here in Detroit when I was going to be here to deliver this word to you, that you are chosen. And it is a privilege to be chosen by God. But today I want to talk from the book of John. You can go to the first slide. John 15, verses 1 through 14. And you know, one of the things that I like about the word of God, here you have so many different types of versions of the word of God. And this one says, I am the true vine, and my father is a gardener. He cuts off every branch in me and in you that bears no fruit. While every branch that bears, that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will be even more fruit. Can you imagine that pruning cannot be always easy? I like what another way of saying this is. It says, I am the real vine, and my father is the father. He cuts off every branch of me that does not bear grace, and every branch that is great bearing, he proves back so that it will bear even more fruit. You are already pruned back by the message I've spoken. This is Jesus speaking. He says, you've already been pruned back by the message he spoke. You may not know where this is, but this is in California. This is at a vineyard. This is at a vineyard. I don't know if this vineyard is still standing today because of the fires that California had. But two years ago, I took that picture in California at a vineyard. And the reason why I took it, because I know that the Bible talks about us being the branches and Jesus being the vine. And it went on to say, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me. Let's remember that. He says, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. You cannot grow and prosper in Jesus unless you remain in him. The other way of saying, he says, live in me. Make your home in me. Just as I do in you. Don't you know that Jesus is wanting to make his home in you? He said, just as he does. How many people like being at home? I'm kind of like a homebody. I like home. You know, I have, I have a couple of cousins that love to eat out. I tell them I don't love to eat out. Now I'll go eat out, but I'd rather cook my own food and be at home. Right. Because I'm kind of like a homebody. Can you imagine that Jesus is making his home in you? That is awesome. You know, at home, what do we find? We find our comfortable shoes. We find our comfortable clothes, you know, the raggy clothes. We just love to go up, go away. We find those things at home. Right. But Jesus has already made his home in you. He said, but I love what he said. He said, in the same way that a branch can't bear fruit or bear grapes by itself, but only by being joined to the vine, you can't bear fruit unless you are joined to the vine. You can't grow unless you are, what, connected to Jesus. You can't grow. How do we think we get our food? It has to be connected to something, right? right? We can't grow if we're not connected to Jesus. It's not about being connected to Sarah Jane or Billy Bob. It's about being connected to Jesus. This is where we grow, is being connected to him. Well, what do you mean, being connected to Jesus? Well, it goes on to say in John 15, 5 through 8, what does it say? It says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withered. Such branches are picked up and thrown into a fire and burn. If you don't remain in him, you're just branches that are going to be burned. How many like a good fire at home? I like a fireplace. 
I'm getting to the point though I think I might want to gas one someday because I'm tired of cleaning it up. Because what does after happens with the wood? What happens when it burns? What's left? Ashes. ashes. And ashes are what? A mess. So, but if we don't stay with Jesus, we're going to be just like the ashes. We're going to be a mess. We're going to be a mess. But I love it here how it says here. I am the vine, you are the branches. When you're joined with me and I with you, the relations is intimate and organic. The harvest is sure to be abundant. How many like abundant harvest? How many like abundant fruit? I know I do. When I go to school, I, the store rather, I don't look for damaged fruit, do you? No. I look for some healthy, some good fruit. And if organic ain't too expensive, I'll buy that. He went on to say, separate as you can, can't produce a thing. Anyone who separates from me is dead wood. Gather up and throw on the bonfire. Dead wood, dead works, dead life. You know how sometimes when you feel like you're trying to go somewhere and you can't get there, and it's like, well, wait a minute, God, you promised me this, you promised me that. Do we ever talk, stop and just take a look and say, am I really in your will, God? You wonder why the door didn't open. Am I in your will, God? Or am I producing dead works? Because see, you might not be connected when you should be. You might have let some interference come in. You know what interference is? Fear, faithlessness. Maybe some of that has came in. I don't know. But we need to be what? Bearing what? Fruit. Healthy fruit. And this way, I'm going to read it from here. It says, but if you make yourself at home, there's that home again, with me, and my words are at home in you, you can be sure, this is what he says, you can be sure that whatever you act will be listened to and acted upon. This is how my father shows who he is. When you produce grapes or good fruit, when you mature as my disciple. See, now, he said a whole bunch here. He said, about, let me go back. He said, you can be sure that whatever you ask will be listened to and act upon. But first of all, he's saying that after he says that if you make yourself at home with me, and my words are at home in you. Because see, then you're not going to be asking for stupid stuff. <laughs> then you're going to be asking for his will. You know, one of the things that happened to me and my husband was, we, I asked the Lord, well, we both asked the Lord last year, around New Year's, because I kept pressing it, but I was like, I want to be on adventure, Lord. I want to experience adventure. You know, because you know how your life can get sometimes is you're just doing the same thing every day. Your car can drive itself. Your, your wife or husband can answer each other's sentence. Because, you know, you're so used to the norm. And so I asked God for that. And so not knowing when I asked him for that, that he was going to hear me. And that he was going to plant me in a place far away from my family. Well, at least my immediate family, because I do have cousins but from my family. I did not say what type of family I came from. My mother had 14 children. I am her middle child between, you know, can you get a middle of 14? <laughs> yeah, me and my one sister, we're kind of middle. I am her middle child. So I raised seven kids. I have 19 grandchildren. Only two of them, one daughter lives in Boston. I currently have 10 siblings living. One just passed away. And so when I asked for a venture, I didn't know God was going to uproot me from all my family, the immediate family, all my nieces, nephews, and all those people. It's interesting because I just told some uh, congregation when I was preaching, I said, 
You know why I stay in Washington? I said, I stay in Washington because I have my children and I want my grandkids to know me. And my need great nieces and all my nieces. And right after that, God began to check me. I had two, five grandkids last year that would come over after school and before school. One day, the two teenagers, all you know, well, actually all my sons. I have a son who is a single father who's raising four kids. And his kids love to argue with each other. So one day they was in my house arguing. And I looked at them and the Lord said, who told you that you had to stay here? And that quick instance he delivered me from even thinking that I had to stay there. And then by May, he had already started the movement of having me to be transformed into a new place. See, God will do things, but if we will learn as we begin to seek God and put God's words at home in us, we don't ask for the big cars. We don't ask for the million dollar home. We begin to ask for Jesus. You know, like Solomon, when he did not ask for all those things, he just asked how could he lead God's people and what came with all that. He got everything with that. More than he probably needed all those wives. He couldn't have it. But the key is we have to make ourselves at home with God. And God has called you and me to make ourselves at home. Why? Because Jesus is the vine. If you look at this next slide, you cannot tell the difference between all the different vines. But guess what? As we sit in this room, Jesus knows the difference between you, me, and each and every one of us. Jesus can see the difference. Jesus knows the calling. Jesus knows the person. He knows who you are. I don't care how young you are. Young people, I say, get Jesus while you're young. Because see, I was, I was my mother's middle child, and I was a crazy child, too. But God spared my life. I like to tell people, I was almost killed 13 times before the age of 29. God had a purpose. I didn't know it was Jesus that I was seeking. See, I didn't know that because I just cried out to God. I wasn't raised in the church. My mother went to church, but even when we showed up, it seemed like the only message the pastor ever had was about us. And so I would dress in holy pants and make sure he had a message. You know, but he never did. So I was never really introduced, at least in my mind, to the real Jesus. But I was still chosen by God. God is an awesome God. God chooses people. The word says in, in John 15, 16, it says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. See, sometimes we think we choose Jesus, but Jesus had already chose us. And he said, and appointed you so that you might go. He gave us a reason. He, he didn't choose us just for us to sit down and do nothing. He chose us so that we can go and bear fruit. I don't care if your fruit is in your kitchen, where you're just having your grandkids around, or people in your neighbors around, and you're blessing them, you're talking about Jesus, whatever the ministry is. God has chosen us to bear fruit. And he said fruit that will last. He's not asking us to bear fruit that won't last. You know, sort of like Jonah. When Jonah got mad about going to Nivea, God put that tree up for your little vine. And then the next morning, he tucked it away. That's not the kind of fruit that Jesus is saying for us. He said he wants us to bear fruit that will last. Fruit that will go from generation to generation. See, I learned how to be a generational thinker. I don't just think about today. I think about my next generation. I, be, I look at who's going to come after me. What is God saying about each and every one of the individuals he's called us to? I have to think beyond just what I see. You know, you have to think beyond just what you see. Because when I look around this neighborhood, what do you see? Devastation. But I'm here to tell you, God is still God. God is still on the throne. And you know what? Even around this country, all you hear is people saying Detroit, Detroit is coming back. 
Detroit is coming back. But how much more if the kingdom of God is ready will God begin to restore this area, even in a greater way? It's not for Satan. It's for the kingdom of God. You know, there's people, there's so much history that came out of Detroit. Yes. You know, I remember years ago when I came to a family reunion, I had to go by the Motown. You know, you had to check out the Booth Motown. All the sounds came out of here. What about the sound of the Lord coming out of here again? What about the word of God coming out of Detroit again? What about it? He's chosen you. It may not, like I said earlier, it may not look like a lot right now. But if you just let God do what he wants to do in you, you'll be amazed how big God is. God is a big God. And God wants to use you. And he said, bear fruit and fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, Jesus' name, not Sheila's name, not your neighbor's name, in Jesus' name, the Father will give to you. Because see, that's what I learned when I got saved. I learned that all those years of calling out to God, that I had to get to Jesus first. I, God could not answer me unless I went through the door, which is Jesus. And when I discovered Jesus, I've never been the same. I discovered Jesus 33 years ago almost. And guess what? I tell people all the time, I've never desired to backslide. You know why? Because I didn't like my life. But I love the life in Christ. Why do I love the life in Christ? Because I know by living for Jesus that all things are possible. I know that living through Jesus, that he has opened up doors that I never even thought or imagined. I've been able to go to Africa, Italy, Greece, and Mexico, of course. It wasn't because I had a lot of money. It was because I had Jesus. He gave me the sense and the wisdom and how to do it. God is an awesome God. This is from a lady, like I said, that should have been dead before the age of 29. This is from a lady who dropped out of school at 16 years old, but right now finishing her doctor degree. This is from that lady that God raised up. Because see, the point was, I didn't know who I was before <laughs> Jesus. I didn't know I was chosen. I didn't know how great God was, but once you get a hold of that, God can do all things. And young people, I want to say to you, sometimes you think, I don't want to go to school, education is important, but I'm here to tell you, you may not think it's important, but education can open up doors. It can open up doors that God can use you in. God can give you favor. God can open up a door that no man can shut. And guess what? I can remember I was also a woman who stayed on welfare for 17 years. Had no vision for life. But got off of it. Been off for 27, 28 years. But guess what? Even with that, I can remember one day walking back into, I was doing some recruiting for a college, and I remember going to the welfare office to talk to them about something about college. And I walked in the door, and the lady said, I know you're not on welfare. <laughs> See, God had changed me so much. She had no idea that I had been. She couldn't even tell because of the change that God had done. I'm telling you, chosen by God means something. I want you to know that. I want you to know I'm not just stopping by here because I didn't have anything else to do. I'm stopping by here because God gave me a word for you. He wants you to remember that you're chosen by him. He wants you to know that all things are possible if you stay at home with him, if you stay connected in the branch. It's important to stay connected. 1 Corinthians says in 1, 26 and 28, it says, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when God chose you. I just told you who I was. I was a hot mess. For God chosen. It says, not many of you were considered wise by human standards. No. I was considered one to be dead. I remember the old store man, he told me that one day. I went to go see him right before he passed away. And, and I came in a room, he was laying on his bed, 
and I brought a couple of my children with me. They were a little young still. And I brought them, he said, I thought you'd be dead. <laughs> and I understood what he said, but he was like, what is this guy talking about? I mean, I understood it, but God. See, he thought so, but God. God is awesome. And then not many of you were powerful. I had no power. I didn't understand the educational system. I had no power. People looked down on me because I was on welfare. I had no power. Oh, but the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Watch out, devil. Yes, I tell you what about power, man. It's all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah, because he said, every knee shall bow and every yes. tongue shall look and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And guess what? I got like this. Not many of you belong to important families. No. They didn't really know my family. But guess what? I've been on every news channel, every in Seattle, I've been on every news channel, been on radio. I have gotten awards for my school. Mel was a, a medallion award just recently. I've been in two magazines, uh, one from my school, one from Seattle Met, which is a um, business magazine. I've been in that. You know what? I'm a little known now. <laughs> and that was not because of me. You know what that was? When I dealt with and, and worked in human trafficking, what we call in our hood, what prostitution and them. When I worked in that field, God opened up the door. See, I didn't say that when I was young, I got involved in that at 16. I married somebody who put me on the street. See, I married the wrong person. But guess what? God used my shame to glorify him. He used my brokenness to help others. See, he healed me from my shame years before. He told me to go back to this ministry. He also did another work in me. He made me, well he didn't mean, well he made me, go back and get a GED and an education all the way up to a doctor okay. before, or at least a master before he put me in that work. Because okay. he knew that I would be talking to a lot of people, legislators and senators and different people. He needed me to do that. So God does choose us. Even when we make a mess, he chooses us. He cleans us up. He doesn't tell us to hide our mess. He has to heal us from our shame first. And then he wants to produce fruit after. His time, not mine. But God chose, but God chose the foolish thing of the world to shame the wise. See, my life and who I am was foolishness to a lot of my friends in the world that are doctors and lawyers. See, my life is foolishness. Your life is going to be foolishness to them. But God, but God, I like that. You see, I, it, you see the one that highlighted, but God, but God chose. God is awesome. Maybe some of you, maybe your parents didn't really like you or thought you was important, but guess what, but God. But God chose you. But God, and it went on to say, God chose the weak things, even when you're weak. God chose the weak things. Anybody ever feel weak sometimes? Yeah. I know I do. Things of the world, the weak things of the world to shame strong. the strong. He'll take the weak things, the weak person. The African American that you know that America seems to hate you. But God will take you and raise you up. Do you hear me? God will put a Liz in here for you. God will open up a door that man no man can shut. God will take those weak things. Oh, he's an awesome God. God chose the things of the world that are common and look down upon. This area is looked down upon from a man's eyes. But God's eyes know. God sees health, beauty. You know, I remember years ago, my mother raised us in houses in Seattle. And we never lived in a project or anything like that. 
But I remember when I got saved and my mother said, well, sign up for housing. Because all my sisters were involved in that housing. And, you know, Section 8 and that type of stuff. And so they all had nice houses. So what I did, first thing that came up was a project. No way, I'm going to live there. And so I didn't take that one. And guess what? When the second one came up, guess what it was? It was a different project. So I said, okay, God, you must want me to go live in High Point where we go to this company. So me and my three kids, by then I was no longer married. I was divorced. Me and my three kids went to live in this High Point housing. You might would call it luxury because it really was. Consider Seattle versus here. It was. But the key was, when I went in there, because I was a believer now, I didn't see the devastation. All I could see was the beauty of the place. All I could do was minister to people, talk to people, help them to have vision beyond just that area. Okay. This is how God sees Detroit. He sees beauty. There's vision. God has vision. If you, if you just tune in, you can catch it. So I just want you to know that you're chosen by God. That even though the world may think you're common, that's not God. God chose the things considered unimportant to do away with the things considered important. Guess what? You may be the ones that will change legislation. You may be the ones that will be able to influence the government here. Guess what? You know. God knows what he considers is important. But guess where you get the information from? Yeah, Stay connected. Staying with the vine. Be in the branches. Being at home with God. And not being home with your circumstances. Not being home with the property thinking. Not being home with the mentality of I can't. I used to take, teach youth all the time. I said, we're kicking that word out, I can't, because you can. The Bible says we can do all things in Christ who strengthens us. Yes. Even if you got to get on your knees and crawl, we can still do it. Because he said, because the examples of people who were chosen by God, King Saul, as you see, I put up there King Saul. He was a people pleaser. That's why he lost the kingdom. See, God chose Saul. Right. Saul was the tallest one out of all the people. But Saul did not know how to follow instructions. Right. He was always trying to please people. You can't be a people pleaser in this thing. And you have to be able to follow God's instructions. And guess what? Sometimes God uses people to tell you what to do. So you still have to follow instructions. But you always continue to ask God. We don't live in a world by ourselves. We are connected to the vine. The vine has lots of branches. If you see a vine with one branch, there's something wrong. Because we are connected. King David. You know, it's interesting. God chose King David, David before he became king. His father didn't even consider him. He brought all his sons. Jesse brought all his sons up. Didn't even think about David. David wasn't even considered that one time. But God did not let Samuel anoint none of the other brothers. He had to ask him, is there another? God may be saying today, is there another? Yeah, David, the thing I like about David, David was out there learning how to shepherd the flock. David was out there worshiping God. David was out there killing lions and bears. Wow. See, David was out there in his obscurity, in his darkness, learning how to stand with God. You know what? You may be in obscurity right now. You may feel like you're in a dark place, but let God teach you what he needs to teach you. Because once you come to the light, you've got to be ready. See, David was ready. Even when Saul used to throw javelins at him, David had a good heart because David never, but one time when he cut a little bit of his robe and he repented, David knew how to stay and how to be a humble man in God. Right. David was a man of God. God chose both of them, but one knew what to do. God is awesome. And then you have Queen Bashai. 
Now, I get it. Her husband probably was drunk and trying to flaunt around all his friends. I get that. The king. But yet, she still re rejected his call. She didn't do what she was supposed to do, and she lost the throne. And they didn't, know, they didn't only do it for her. They were concerned about all the other women. They didn't want the rest of the kingdom having a bunch of rebellious women. So they said, we're going to get rid of her. Now, Bashai was beautiful. But yet, Bashai didn't know how to go in and how to come out. She didn't know how to keep her throne. And here, God had to choose another. Esther, an orphan girl. The Bible tells us Esther didn't have a mother and a father. She was probably in foster care system if they would have had one. And then, not only that, she was a Jew. She had all these stripes against her. But yet God, yet God chose Esther. And you know, it's amazing, because the whole book is called Esther. And Bashai is only in really in chapter one. So God knew that he had to use somebody who was what, broken? Because you know how it is if you don't have family. My mother's done to be with the Lord. It's kind of lonely at times. Yet she had an uncle that stepped in and said, hey, I'll be your foster care provider. But he also instructed her. And so God didn't necessarily pick a queen from Queen Sheba. He didn't do all that. He just picked a girl that was an orphan, that was a Jew. And yet God is still looking for more Esther's. He's looking for more David's. He may not be called David, he may not be called Esther. But he's still looking. God is still in need of us. But see, Jesus went up to heaven. He said what? It is finished. But guess whose work is not finished? Our work is not finished. So I want you to know today that I stopped by here to tell you that you are chosen by God. I stopped by here to tell you that God is not done with Detroit. And it doesn't matter how many numbers you see, if you just do what God calls you to do, and stay connected and at home with God, yeah. you will see God move. Yeah. James 2 and 5 says, My dear brothers and sisters, listen to me. Hasn't God chosen those who are poor in the world's eyes and rich in faith? Hasn't he chosen them to receive the kingdom? Hasn't he promised to promise it to those who love him? You know, in today's world, we hear about white privilege. You hear it all the time. And I said, you know what? I'm privileged. I said, I'm privileged by God. I'm telling you, God has given us a faith. Don't you know that? He has made you rich in faith. Faith you can't buy. Faith will stand when nobody else will stand. Faith will take you through the lion's den. Faith will take you through the fiery furnace. I'm here to tell you, money came by faith. But I'm telling you, God said you're rich in faith. It's not about how much money you have. It's not about designer's clothes. It's not about what house you have. It's not about any of that. It's about God. And no, God does want you to have things. I'm not saying he doesn't. Don't get me wrong. I'm not the preacher that thinks that everybody got before. I don't believe that. But I do believe that you have to have your priorities straight before God can move. You have to know that Jesus is real, and that he lives in you, and that he desires you, and that he wants you to abide in him. He wants you to be at home in him. And as I close, I just want to say that God 
is still calling. I don't know how many of you are saved in this room, but if you're not, I'm here to tell you, you can't get at home with God. Just like I couldn't get at home with God until I found out it was Jesus that I needed. But I just want you to know, if you're not at home with God, that the doors of the church are open to receive Jesus, not to just to join a church, but to receive Jesus. Because you can sit in the church all the days of your life and never receive Jesus and die and go to hell. But it's not even about the hell part. See, I didn't come to Christ because of hell. I came to Christ because of the love of Jesus. But there's a love that Jesus can give. There's a love that not even my husband can give me, that Jesus can give me. And I want to tell you, even with my story, that even though I married the wrong person once, God gave me the right person. I have been married currently to my husband this year. It will be 27 years. And I've been married to the right man. See, I understood what the wrong man was like. But see, I, I, like I said, I was, I was my mother's worst child. I was a little rebellious. And it got me in places that I wouldn't desire anyone to be in. But because of Jesus, he's changed my life. He's changed my focus. He's opened up doors. And I want you to know that God is not a respectful person. What he, do, what he did for me, whatever is a need for your life, he'll do for you. And so is there anyone? Well, Father, we thank you for the word of the Lord this morning. Father, we thank you for you, Lord God, who have chosen us to be your people. Father, we pray, Lord God, that the word of life, oh God, will continue to encourage them, and Father, that you would even cause your people to be even more connected to you in a greater way. And Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you for the opportunity to share Jesus this morning. And Father, I thank you for the salvation of the Lord. And Father, I thank you, Lord God, that there is none greater than you. And Father, we give you the glory and we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you and thank you.